Okay. I think this is on, right? Yeah. Good morning. So what I'm going to do is, I think many of you have been having difficulty with the wave propagation part. And I hope movie will work. We just tried it work. And so I will show you that the whatever we covered in the class, if you write the code, assuming the code works, you should get wave propagation. So this is work of a student who took my course. <coughs> maybe, I think it's 2012 probably, so it's four or five years ago. And as you can see, this is the wave, wave propagation. The reason we are writing it, not delta, not E times delta square U over delta X square, is in case there is a variation in the cross section, this will take care of it. So if you write it as delta F over delta X, that's what the Newton second law, or if you draw a free body, di free body diagram, that's what we will get. So F, if you say E times delta U over delta X, that is the axial stress for a linear elastic material. Multiplied by area, you will get the axial force. So this variation can account for, or this kind of, this formulation can account for the change in the cross-section with X. So you can have an antenna where the cross-section is changing regularly, smoothly, or you can have situations where the cross-section changes ab abruptly, or you can have a functionally graded material. E can be a function of X, A can be a function of X, so if you write your governing equation in this form, then you can account for both the spatial variation of the area of cross-section and the modulus. So both, actually both can vary, A and E both can vary. So um, also you can adjust things so that mass density, area of cross-section, and the Young's modulus vary so that the speed, wave speed remains constant. So it's possible. Okay. <laughs> um, this equation we went through. So that's the problem for which I hope the movie will run. So that's a compressive load applied at the left end. The right end is clamped. And it's a triangular pulse. When it meets the fixed end, that compressive wave is reflected back as a compressive wave of twice the amplitude. So by the time it reaches the left end, the pulse has been gone, so it's a free end now. And then the compressive wave is reflected back as a tensile wave. So as you, this is an elastic problem, so it will keep on running. Actually, if the algorithm is correct, there should be no, dis no dispersion. So you should get um, triangular wave staying as a triangular wave. Unfortunately, that's not what happens. This you are seeing only after two, two three cycles, things have changed much. But if you run it for long enough time, unless you take beta equal to 1 over 12 and r equal to 1 over 12 in that mass matrix, the the triangular pulse shape does change. It does not tell you how many elements uh, Jacob took. So the point is that it's not a bogus, whatever I, we covered in the class, it works. And this student, when he did the, this is a homework problem. So it's not a publication stuff. So now in this case, the cross-section changes. So wherever the cross-section changes, part of the wave is reflected and part is transmitted. And the amount that is reflected or transmitted depends upon the ratio of the two areas. 
or the acoustic impedance. So in this case, the change in the area is playing the role of the change in Young's modulus. I will rerun it so that you so please pay attention to where the area of cross section is changing. See, it's changing at the midpoint. And at the midpoint, you can see part of the wave is transmitted and part is reflected. Again, it's an elastic system, so it will keep on <coughs> doing the same thing, except there is some numerical dissipation. We did not cover it, but the numerical algorithm we wrote, it does change the frequencies. So if you give a frequency, if you send a pulse of, say, frequency 50 hertz, numerical algorithm, unless beta is 1 to L and R is 1 to L, the numerical algorithm will change the frequency. So it's not I mean, the numerical algorithm we, we are using either forward difference, central difference, backward difference, or the gamma 1 half, beta 0, 1 over 12, 1 over 4, no matter which one you take there is numerical dissipation, except for one case. And that is when beta is 1 over 12 and R is 1, the mass matrix is 1 over, R is 1 over 12 in that one. Um, so that's in the beta Newmark method. Beta Newmark families of methods have two <coughs> constants, beta and gamma. Both go between 0 and 1. Gamma, we take 1 half. Gamma, we take one half. Beta, depending upon the value of beta, the algorithm may be conditionally stable or unconditionally stable. So if you take beta equal to zero, the one I suggested that we do the exercise, that's forward, that's central difference method. If you take the lumped mass matrix in that one, then you do not have to solve a system of algebraic equation. So that one is very popular because we can solve problems with, say, a million degrees of freedom, there is really no equation to be solved, no algebraic equations to be solved. So that's why it's very popular. But it is conditionally stable, which means you time step size must be controlled. Otherwise, your solution will blow up. So critical time step size we discussed was the minimum element size divided by the maximum wave speed. We take, roughly speaking, one half of that value. So as we said, you need to do the problem for two different finite element meshes. For each mesh, you should do the problem for at least two different time step sizes to make sure that the solution is OK. You have a question. Oh, you know, you are asking me to remember something that student did five years ago. Sorry. I have no idea. So my best guess will be at least two, three hundred. But I do not know the answer. So let's see if uh, this one runs. No, this one doesn't like to run. I don't know why. They were running. Well, <laughs> First two ran fine, now it's giving me trouble again. Where is the button? Where is play button? This one. Pardon? if any other works. This one might work. You know, in the morning I tried them twice. All of them worked. 
Sorry, I mean, it, because I was going to show you what happens for the nonlinear problem and the linear problem. The linear I showed you now for two cases. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I see, I see problem now. <coughs> yeah, I think no, maybe. So this one, we already saw that. Let's see if this one works. No. Sorry, it doesn't work. Okay, so let's close this. What? Let's discuss. Why is not showing? Oh, we need one. Maybe I, I'm, there's something wrong that I'm doing. It's only showing two. This one talks about comparison of solutions with MLS and SSP at basis functions. We discussed both yesterday, and this one compares the solutions of some problems by these two methods. And I'm hoping this thing will work. And if you have internet, then you can probably download this paper. Pardon me? I'm sorry? Which one? Oh, PPT? Yeah, I can share it. I can send it to you. It might work on your laptop. Yeah, I will email it to you. I mean, I will email to Professor Dinesh Kumar, and then he will forward to you. There is a backup plan, so don't worry. If this doesn't work, I will use the chalkboard. <laughs> it's showing my screen. Then you will change it back <coughs> to where, whatever it was. Oh, yeah, good, works. Good, thank you. Oh, no, but wait, wait, let's make it loud, loud, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I do not know, I know you can probably see the title, but I'm sorry, I did not copy, cut and paste figures and try to make a PPT. So, oh, well, I think we, So as you can see, the, it will compare the performance of the SSPH and MLS basis functions. That was the group, it is actually most of the work, actually all of the work in this one is really done by Chi Long Sai, and unfortunately he did not finish his PhD. So he has two publications, but he decided to quit after that and did not complete it. So just having one or two publications sometimes is not enough to, to get the PhD. I mean, I have had one more student who, so two more. One had one paper and he did not finish. The other has, I think, two papers and did not finish. And this one also has two papers and did not finish. 
So the and if you are interested in those matrices, yesterday uh, Shakti was talk well, he was trying to get, and I think you were trying to get it with him. This one has the matrix part. So I'm not going to go over those equations which we discussed in the class, but I will just talk about the results. So the first problem is a cantilever beam <coughs> with a not uniformly distributed, but a tangential traction at one end. And this traction is applied, it's not uniform, it's a parabolic variation, because that is what the elasticity theory requires. We have the exact solution of this problem, that's written here. So, so we know the solution, and we are trying to now see if we can solve, if we can compare our numerical solution with this one. Please stop me if you have, whenever you have questions because I may be going too fast. So the analytical solution is in red color. And you can see that if you use moving least square approximation, cubic means we are using one x, x square and x cube. This is cubic polynomials of degree three, complete polynomials of degree three to drive the basis functions. Quartic means degree four. And, oh, sorry, I think I misspoke, 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 sorry, sorry. Cubic is the weight, weight function is cubic. See, we wrote yesterday there was a weight function, Gaussian. So this is a cubic, poly, cubic weight function or quart quartic weight function or Gaussian weight function. I can show you the expressions for those. I think I only gave you the expressions for Here, here, yeah, okay. So you see the, that's the cubic spline. Then the next one is quartic means fourth degree. And then the, below that is going to be the Gaussian function. So with, the, and yesterday we talked about beta. I did not use the word beta, but I only used H. So you can either vary H or you can vary beta times that. It's the same thing. Uh, and now if you look at the um, solution for both, uh, for the MLS, oh sorry, it's not. It does not tell how many points we used. It will come. So it will, we have studied, or Sai studied the effect of the weight function, number of particles, number of integration points. So everything, and compared the result from the two basis functions, MLS and F. Also there is, you see, quantitative indicator of error. This from this one, you cannot tell whether the two solutions, like how close they are or how, how far away they are, but you will see the quantitative numbers. Okay, here they are. 
let me move it up a little bit. So this is the error in the displacement. This one is the error in the stresses. And as you can see, these are percentages. Or sorry, this is not percent. So this is like 2%. And the MS SSPH is 3%. If you use R degree polynomial, then the error is, this is less, but this is more. So there is no monotonic thing going on. If you use Gaussian, this is 2%, this is 3%. The stress in, the error in the stress is generally is, is higher than that in the displacements because you have to find gradients. So in this case, you see 3% with the MLS and about two and a half percent with the SSPH. We cannot say out of, when you look at this exercise, which one of the two is a better one. So both of, both more or less give you the same, same error. Number of particles is kept same in both of them. Everything else is kept same. So you are comparing apples with apples. The only thing is you are using, you are, you are driving basis functions differently. Okay, so now let's look at some other exercise. I think he did five problems. How do I move it up? The whole thing, I guess, I can't. So I hope you can see it. number of particles. I think yesterday I was saying sprinkle the particles. So in this case, these are uniformly distributed. There are 21 along the horizontal axis, five along the vertical axis. We say cantilever beam. It's a two-dimensional problem. So 21 times five, 33 times five, 33 times nine, and the error really doesn't change much. It does not significantly reduce when you go from 21 times five, which is 105 points, to something like 300 points. And same thing for both of them, I mean the, it's roughly 1%. So it's not, that really, that indicates that 21 times five is a reasonable distribution of particles. These are, not, these are uniformly distributed. There is no adaptive refinement in this case. Like the, the particles are not concentrated near the near the clamped end or the free end. Yes. Uniformly distributed. Uniformly. So if the length is length of the ball is ten centimeters, the distance between particles in the horizontal direction is ten over twenty one. We have to give coordinates to each and every element, yes. Every, sorry, to node, particle, yeah. And you can generate, if you wish, non-uniformly distributed or uniformly distributed. You will see examples where they are non-uniformly distributed, assuming the system keeps on working. You will see that example too. It's not really, see, the error has not changed much when we, the idea generally is that if you keep on refining the mesh, your error should keep on decreasing. But when you go from say 20 times five, which is 105 to three times the number of particles, the error really has not go, gone anywhere. It's from 1.8% to 1%. So it's, there's no big benefit. which means the coarse mesh, like coarse distribution of particles, 21 times five would have been enough. But we don't know it beforehand. We could have tried, I mean, it, it depends how much, uh, maybe he got tired of my asking him to do more work and he quit. But 
So the point is, we could have tried less than 21 times Y. And probably that would have been enough. OK, so and this is the error in the stresses. If you do this problem with the finite element method, error in the stress is higher. But in this case, you don't see that much higher uh, error in the stresses. And that's because these basis functions you get, they are, they are differentiable everywhere in the domain. So you don't have to worry about finding these at the integration points. And these are errors in the, these are not soup, no, this is not soup norm. This is not supremum norm. This is not finding mac errors, maximum of the errors at any location. This is global error no indicator, not the local error indicator. So there is a possibility that at one point or two points or a few points, the error is larger than what I am showing you here. So these are global error indicators, not local error indicators. You will see that too. Here is coming. You are just one second ahead of me. So when we when we talk about the convergence, you usually plot log of the error versus log of the distance between two adjacent particles. And in this case, uh, the horizontal axis. is that parameter beta, which appears in the weight functions, beta times h is the support is the over which the weight function is non-zero. Pardon? Sorry? h is the distance between two adjacent particles. In this case, h is constant because, well, for a given mesh, h is constant because you are, um, if you are using 21 times 5, so h is equal to 10 over 21, length over 21. And then you are changing beta to adjust the um, region over which the function, over which the weight function is non-zero. So the, value, the larger the value of this number, beta, the more <coughs> number of particles are interacting with each other. And if you go from, say, 3 to Four, you see a drop in the error, but after that, it makes no difference. And I think yesterday I mentioned, unfortunately, we cannot prove theorems. So you have to do these numerical experiments. There's no implication that if, I, if we found beta equal to four is optimal here, if you go and do an elastic plastic problem, that beta equal to four will be optimal. No. Only for linear elastic problems, yes. But if you go to a nonlinear problem, you cannot derive any, you cannot learn anything from here and apply to nonlinear problem. So he did convergence study for every parameter that um, appears in the weight functions. If you take, say, the order of polynomial, one, two, or three, you take one, two, or three, you can see that the higher the degree of the polynomial in the basis functions, the lower the error. But it's not, it's not at the same rate. Like if you go from first degree polynomial to second degree polynomial, then the error decreases quite a bit. But if you go to, these are logarithmic, these are logs of errors, not, these are not absolute values. So this is logarithmic. So the, like this one, you can say is 10 to the minus 1.6, <coughs> 10 to the minus 2. So there's a big change in a way, because this is not, it's not giving you, abs, like you don't interpret as from minus 1.6 to minus 2. That's uh, one was with the for the displacement. This one is with the stresses. 
to show you that in this method, stresses work very well. And these are the numerical values for which you saw the plots. Let me show you results for a different problem then. Oh, if you want to compute energies, if you want to compute state energy, we talked about yesterday because we use overlapping regions. To find state energies, you have to use a background mesh. There is no choice. I mean, there is no easy way out because we don't we cannot integrate over overlapping regions and find the state energy of the body. So that's why you need a background mesh. And so in this case, the background mesh was used. And if you look at the figure on the right, no, right side, you can see the convergence of the energy as you change R. And the value, then the parameter R Sorry, I don't remember what is the R. The third one you see, PD, that's pseudo derivatives. That was method was given by Britschko at Northwestern. When we submitted the paper, the reviewers came back and said, no, you should compare your results with the one if you use pseudo derivatives. And that was, they gave us a reference, which is Britschko's paper. So that roughly means one of Blitzko students reviewed our paper. Yeah. Rough guess. So we did, of course. And then you can see that I think the rate of convergence, this is this rate of convergence that R, it's not that much different, 1.44, 1.47, and 1.43. And both, sorry? Yeah. Well, for a linear elastic problem, it's not necessary. But for a nonlinear elastic problem, yes. Or, non, or elastic elastic problem, yes. You have to see something else also. Because display stresses, you need displacement gradients. For a linear elastic problem, the strain energy is roughly speaking proportional to the stress square or strain squares. If the material is inhomogeneous, then the answer is yes, you must check it because wherever you see inhomogeneity, stresses and strains can be quite different. So in general, it's, not a, it's a good idea, but the reason we did here is to show or to emphasize that even though this is a meshless method to compute strain energies, you need a background mesh. Only for energies, not for anything. In this method, not for anything else. But if you want to compute energies, then you must do it. I will show you in a little while results of one problem with eight different codes. Commercial codes, not mine. And you will see eight different answers. You pick whatever you like. Eight different codes eight different answers for the same problem. Same initial conditions, same boundary conditions, same plate, same loading applied, same elastic modulus, and so on. And that is not my work. That is uh, That was published years ago. So I just copied that figure from the literature. I will show you that. Yeah. Yes, I think one way to one way to check the accuracy of your code or the accuracy of your results, not necessarily the code, is to do energy balance. So when we are solving these equations, we are solving these based on the balance of mass and balance of linear momentum and balance of angular momentum or moment of linear momentum. We are not using the balance of energy. So it's a good idea to compute the work done by external forces and show that it equals the sum of the kinetic energy plus potential energy plus energy dissipated if you have plasticity. 
or if you have viscous effects. So if, and there is one thing more. We did not talk about it, but I know. If you have an incompressible material, then you have some other issues. Also, if you use reduced integration, like I said, you use two by two by two. For a cubic element in a three-dimensional problem, which means you have eight noted element. So you generally use two by two by two, two integration points in each direction. If you are using an explicit method, even if you are not, many times we use only one integration point at the center. <coughs> and that is to save the computer time because using two by two by two means eight integration points. And if you are using one, or instead of eight, I mean, you are saving, roughly speaking, seven eighths of the computer time in computing the element matrices and assembling takes the same amount of time. It's just computing the element matrices. So think of saving roughly 60, 70% of the CPU time. Again, no free lunch. The price paid is that that I will show you in a, in a sketch, maybe in the afternoon, that if you use only one integration point, then there are some spurious yes. modes of deformation that consume zero energy. But they change the shape of the structure. So these are called zero energy modes. They do change the shape. It's not that there is, the strains are induced, except strain at the integration point is zero. But strains and stresses at the other points are not zero. So if you use two by two by two, there is no zero energy mode. If you use one integration point, there can be zero energy modes, which means your solution can be polluted. It can be dirty. In our sense, dirty means no good. I mean, it's, it's not that you have put mud on it, but uh, the solution is no good. So to avoid that, then you have to play games, of course. However, in those zero energy modes, there is some energy dissipated. Even though it's supposed to be zero, but there is some energy dissipated. And all commercial codes, like Abacus, Cellus, Dyna, if you ask it to spit out, means print. If you ask it to print zero energy mode, uh, energy dissipated in zero energy modes, it will do so for you. And if it is 10% of the total in work done of the, on the structure, your solution cannot be relied upon. Because 10% of the energy was basically not used to effectively deform the structure. So please, always do energy balance. When I have, now, as you, when I keep on repeating myself, that in my group I more or less insist, and as I said earlier, I'm, it's a dictatorship, because they, they need signatures, so, so they compute it, they do the energy balance. Some students come and complain, I don't know how to do it, Abacus is not doing for me, I said, no excuses accepted, period. You have to do it. They, next day they come, they do it. I mean, so it's pressure. So if your boss said, okay, you do energy balance, and if you don't do it, I won't, you won't have a job next month, you will learn and you will do it. So it's, in the, it's a requirement. For your own good, for your own safety, you should do energy balance. That means the work done by external forces has gone into changing the kinetic energy, strain energy, plastic dissipation, viscous dissipation, frictional effects, if you have any friction in the, it all depends whether you have in the code. You cannot just say, oh, the energy was dissipated by, due to frictional forces. But they are not in the equation, so why, so why should they be dissipated? Only term that you have in your equations, you can say energy went for this term or that term. Otherwise, numerical dissipation, you cannot say it went 10%. I mean, one percent may be okay for numerical dissipation, but if it is ten percent in numerical dissipation, that intercontinental ballistic missile India launched today, it won't go. 
And 10% is a lot of energy <coughs> being lost, which really means you will have to have engine booster engines and the, for the missile engines 10% stronger than what they are. And that's a lot of money. And this is not only one time. I mean, if we are going to keep this, design these missiles and manufacture them in thousands, see how much energy will be wasted. So please, do energy balance. Even if you write your own code, do energy balance. Makes no difference what problem you are doing. OK. So let's uh, keep on going. Now this is a stress concentration problem. So we have a plate with a hole. And the idea is to see if we can find the stress intensity factor or stress concentration. And so we can exploit the symmetry of the problem and do quarter of the plate. That's what it is being done here. And you will see probably, I don't know how to get rid of this half screen showing up. I'm, as you know, I'm not good in this computing business. OK, so now you can see. I think many of you were asking particle distribution should be uniform or non-uniform. So you can see it's not uniform. Because we expect things happening here, or gradients, sharp gradients here. This is not adaptive. This is not adaptive placement of nodes or particles. This is just a guesswork. And then once you do it, then you can change it if you like. And you will see the results are reasonably good. Any questions about this? Pardon? You mean for uh, satisfying the essential boundary condition? Penalty mapping. Yeah. Again, the analytical solution is given on the left. So we know how to. So you are seeing three different distribution of particles. Like it says, 135, 297, and 369 particles. That's not large in the, if you think of these as nodes, it's really not that many nodes. Oh, sorry. Okay, so the, let's see. If you look at the, these pictures are a little bit deceiving because uh, they look, the solutions look kind of close to each other, but here there is a difference. So, so there is some difference in the solutions from the three methods, three basis functions. One is L, um, MLS, SSPH, and the pseudo derivatives. It will come. It will come. It's here. Pardon? In this case, it's better than displacements. Again, you know, I can, I can change the scales. <coughs> like, we have 0 0.5 to 3, or I could have gone from 1 to 3 or one to two, one to two, and showed you differences. Or I could have gone from say zero to ten, and you will see nothing, no difference. So say, unless you give quantitative information, graph, graphs can be deceiving. Does it make sense? <coughs> Incidentally, you can download this paper. This is on my website. So it's. It's nothing classified or secret stuff. And you, I gave you my website yesterday. So this is a crack propagation problem. And in this case, um, we have a plate with a crack at the center. And if you load it crack, if you, I don't think this one crack is propagating, but we Propagation problem too. Pardon? Yeah, yeah. 
you, you will see that today. I, so like on the table, you see the error in the stress intensity factor um, with the MLS, SSPH, and also it gives you the error. So it's like 0 0.95, but roughly 1%. So it's not terribly bad. I mean, if you, if you refine the mesh, like, sorry, add more nodes, you might be able to reduce it. So A over B is the, A is the crack length, and B is the width of the plate, like this dimension parallel to the crack. So depending upon the size of the crack over the width, you can see that the error we are getting is about 2%. So Sai did a good job I mean, in, in computing results, but it's unfortunate that he lost patience. Or it's my fault that I, I was asking for too much. I don't know. So this one gives you the mesh. Uh, and as you can see, the mesh is, uh, oh, this is, a, I think, track propagation problem. It's a, Yeah, okay. Say this problem, but by exploiting the symmetry, we can do quarter of the plate. So the, we are not doing the entire plate, it's quarter of the plate. And so you, the mesh you see is for the quarter of the plate. And that's wherever you see dark portion, that's where the crack tip is. Okay, now let's see if the, well then we also did the cracks from the two edges. We also, or he also did asymmetric crack. In this case, I think there is a crack propagation. And as you can see here, the mesh is uh, quite non-uniform. So you basically have to design the mesh by looking at what kind of results you might get. Just one second. So in this case, I'm sorry, what was your question? No, no, no. No, we don't, we don't generate mesh with the hyper mesh and then just take the nodes. I mean, he could have done that. And so I don't know how he generated the coordinates of the nodes. I did not ask him. I mean, this is not, I'm more interested in the, uh, mechanics of it rather than how he generated the mesh. Okay, now if you look at the, see, that's what I was saying about the scales. See, in this case, looks like there's a huge difference, right, between the results. But this is 0.5 and that's 0.49. So it's really not that much difference. So we magnify the scale and show, yeah, there's a huge difference. But it, so we have to write in the paper that this, the scale is highly magnified, so the difference is like <coughs> roughly 0 0.01 out of 0.5, so it's 2%. So it's not a major difference. And you can see the, the red curve is SSPH, and this one is the so-called analytical solution of the problem. Okay. There are some things which I have not talked about. I mean, I realized that if you want to study crack propagation. Um, but in this one, the results are compared with experiments, and you can see that both methods give results. Um, this is the crack path. This is indeed the crack. Um, and then you see so many names in the paper was that second author, he did the experiments. And um, again, as I think we often criticize that there are a lot of names on it. Some of them are just for courtesy, which is true, they did nothing. Um, but anyway, 
enough said. And some of them are for courtesy, yes. Okay, I'm sorry? Uh, this is, you can, I will show you the configuration. This is the one. So these experiments were done in our lab. You saw many people there. So some of them did experiments. So one of them did experiments, and the other one was his advisor for the experimental part. So four names are justified, but the other three are courtesy sake. I'm sorry? <coughs> this is a monotonic loading. It's not fatigue. No, no, it's not fatigue. No, it's not fatigue loading. Monotonic loading. Yeah, basic, the idea is to show you it's asymmetric loading. So you are hold, there's a pin here, and there's a pin here, so you are pulling like that. I cannot see without with the glasses on this screen, so that's why I have to take it off. Okay, so I think that shows you that the results, that the cracks can propagate. No, maybe in the afternoon I will talk, just one, let me say one thing. In the afternoon I will talk about the crack initiation criteria and the crack propagation criteria. Without those criteria, the code cannot do the job. So we have to tell, okay, the crack should initiate according to this criteria. It should propagate, depending upon the solution, it should propagate in this direction from the crack tip. Without those, that piece of information, those two pieces of information, we cannot study crack propagation. Does it make sense? I mean, we need to decide when we are full. My, our stomach tells us, yes, we are full now, so don't eat anymore. So the same thing here, we have to tell, hey, crack, start. Then our stomach or our tongue tells, okay, yeah, you should eat something like this, it's more tasty. So we have to tell the crack, hey, go in this direction, you will have easier path. No, we have to tell it, which means we have to give equations. When we say tell, you cannot just say go, we have to give equations. Yes, sir. And depending upon those two criteria, the paths you will get will be different. You know, I, I said I will do plasticity problem tomorrow because that will protect me because we advertised it. So we are. I thought of one. I can do one-dimensional problem without get, without worrying too much about um, complexity of the situations. Okay, so this one I think is a. Done. Unless you have any questions about this, I will show you one more. So this one was the comparison of the MLS and SSPH basis functions. And oh, shoot, I proof. Okay. <coughs> so this is a failure. Now. With the this is only with the SSPH method. That's what the title says. Like, and now you can see the number of authors has gone down. We had, a, we had a project funded by the National Science, U.S. National Science Foundation. So th these two are students, and the remaining four of us, we were PIs on that grant. So that's why you see six names. There are two students, and the grant was written with four PIs, or co-PIs, and so there are six. So in the previous one, I showed it had probably names, so two of them were superfluous, or courtesy sake, I guess. Actually, it becomes a big problem, you know, when we, supposing if we had not put these names, like all of these names. Students are justified, but then if you write the next grant proposal and say, we have worked together in the past. The reviewer says, where is the publication? Show us. 
So we cannot justify that, yeah, we had a grant and we worked together for, and we apply for the next one without giving any proof. But this one is legitimate. Except possibly for one person, but this is a legitimate uh, number of authors. Okay, let's see if I, oh, cesium. This is one is about cesium, okay. I'll, but I have to talk about on the chalkboard, cesium. Okay, I'm afraid, I do not know if you can see this. I'm sorry? How can I zoom? Oh yeah, I can do 150. Does it help? No. <coughs> Wait a minute, I think I can do a better job. If you give me one more minute. Um, those of you who do not know the geography of USA and are wondering from where I am, where do I live? So I live in Blacksburg, that's here. I think all of you have heard about President Obama and the next coming President Trump. So they are living here, Washington DC. So it's Blacksburg is roughly 500 kilometers southwest of Washington, D.C. And it takes us maybe four hours, four and a half hours to drive. Some people, my students, they can do it less than four hours because they drive at 150 kilometers an hour. But I don't. Because there's a well, if you are caught, then you get chalon ticket which is heavy, something like $100, $120, then you have to go, depending upon the speed uh, you exceed, then you have to go to the court if you don't pay. If you go beyond 15, 20 miles an hour, then you have to, go, your license is revoked right away, so it's, okay. So these are the people who contributed to matchless <coughs> methods work. So I didn't, as I, as I've been saying, I do nothing. I don't do any work except come and talk. So these are the people who contributed to the meshless work in my group. And if you go to the web page, you will see their works and so on. The code why was, I said is available for free, was written by Ching, you see there. There's another code which is not on the web page, was written by Chen, L-F-Q-I-A-N. In China, Q I Q is pronounced as C-H. So it's Q-I-A-N, but it's Chen. And he, he was a department head when he came with Chinese government money. Man, he worked 24 hours a day. I think he only took one day off. Before leaving, he said he wants to go to Walmart to buy something uh, for his kids, for his daughter. He, had, he has only one child. That's it. I mean, he, it's like a, a robot. Um, machine, I mean, it's amazing. I think I, first let me show you, I, oh, okay, this is what we were talking about. So this has a better picture than the one I had from the paper. Okay, so the comparison of MLPG, this one does not compare M, MLPG and uh, MSH and SSPH basis function, but this only compared meshless with the finite element. So you need weak form. For the meshless, we usually have a local weak form. You drive it on a small domain. For the finite element method, you have a global one. Nodal information, we only need connectivity. Sorry, only need locations. It only coordinates for the meshless. For the finite element, you need both coordinates and connectivity. Incidentally, this is also, this table is in a paper. 
so it's not i mean you can find it on my web page it's in a paper and i sh already showed you the previous one that was in a paper but because of the the font was too small okay subdomain i took only circular well i actually did problem <coughs> the class only for a one dimensional domain but if you have a two dimensional domain which means a plate or a, then you can either have circular circular domains this is the region over which the weight function is non zero or you can have a rectangular they can be overlapping but in the finite <coughs> element work they are polygonal even though most of the time we take either rectangular or triangular N not many people take pentagon or hexagon shaped elements in principle it's okay you can take it there is nothing that prevents us but you hardly you hardly see any paper with that kind of uh, element it's true you can take pentagon as an element element with five sides element with six sides there is nothing magic about three sides or four sides the rule is same to generate basis function or shape function and they are disjoint so the basic functions for the finite element work they are simple polynomials and that is the beauty for the meshless methods we pay the price so they are not simple polynomials if you plot them and if you plot their derivatives they are plotted in at louris book if you plot those derivatives they look very well shaped i mean there are some hills some valleys nothing like that appears in the finite element basis functions but the advantage you get is the derivatives are smooth i mean even though they vary but still they are smooth they give me very good values of stresses okay assembly we don't have to assemble them so there is no such thing as element stiffness matrix and global stiffness matrix but in the finite element work of course we have to assemble them stresses <coughs> strains they are smooth everywhere in the finite element method we you, you should find that special points which i call barlow points and if you don't want to do find barlow points then you find them at integration points quadrature points locking if you are doing problems for incompressible materials now what is an incompressible material nst pardon me poisson ratio is 1/2 that novel comment on it in a minute is partially correct well is correct if you are talking about small deformations of linear elastic materials then poisson ratio is 1/2 but it is not there is no it's not true for a non linear elastic material i think you wanted to say some something else so what is an incompressible material pardon me it is in this room you drink it every day air is we are generally model air as incompressible and you drink we don't we don't drink air of course uh, you drink it every day maybe many times in a day water we assume water is incompressible so but we i did not define what is an incompressible material i just told you i gave you examples of two roughly speaking air and uh, water but what is an incompressible material also all of us have in our human body soft tissues we generally assume they are incompressible but why still did not define what is incompressible material pardon me no it's not quite precise mathematics yeah that is right density is going to be constant this mass density does not change with deformation so in an incompressible material is one that can undergo only <coughs> deformations for which volume does not change so not every possible deformation not every deformation is possible in an incompressible material you can pat yourself on the back you did a good job <laughs> no it's true okay so so if you are doing problems for beams are in 
uh, either beams or incompressible materials or other materials in which you have a constraint. Like for a beam, we say length, sorry, height does not change. Generally, you assume that. So that's a constraint. For incompressible materials, volume cannot change. If the mass density doesn't change, volume cannot change. So that's a constraint. So if you have a constraint problem, or a constraint problem, finite element method, you have to be careful. Because sometimes it, um, it over constraints. But are some, what happens, the mesh locks. And maybe in the afternoon, I can draw a sketch and show you. I don't want to go back and forth between my chalkboard or whiteboard and the screen. So I will draw a sketch in the afternoon. So I owe you zero energy modes for sketch. You can write down so you can remind me what I, if I miss. And you can also, oh, I think I'm, you can also remind me about those uh, constraint problems or incompressible, zero energy modes, incompressible materials. Okay, adding nodes. In the meshless methods, it's easy. In the finite element method, it's difficult because if you add a node, you have to have connectivity. Determination of time step size, if you are doing a transient problem, it's a pain in the neck. That's the phrase we use that is very hard for meshless methods. It's very difficult to find the time step size for a meshless method. For the finite element method, it's relatively easy. So it's a big price to be paid if you want to use a meshless method for a transient problem. The time step size, you have to find maximum frequency. Finding a maximum frequency reasonably well is difficult. I mean, it's like, when I say difficult, it's computationally involved. Nothing is difficult. It's computationally involved. But in the, in the finite element work, no problem. So if you, it's not, you cannot find easily an estimate of the time step size for a meshless method. For the finite element method, you can find in almost every book. I use the word almost, I do not say every book. No. So I think that is a price to be paid for a meshless method. Integration rule, I mentioned yesterday because you are integrating over a circle. Integrating over a circle, when you map, I think you asked me yesterday, you, when you map a square onto a circle, then not all of the integration points are uniformly distributed in the circle whereas they are uniformly distributed in the square. So it's a problem. Um, you can use lower order integration rule for the finite element method, but you have to use higher order integration rule for the meshless method. You don't have to copy it, it's in a book. Sorry, it's in a paper. You can download the paper from my website and it's in that one. So it's in the Journal of Thermal Stresses, that paper. So it's not, a, I think it's, Co-author is Chan, LF Chan, QIAF. And it's on functionally graded materials and Journal of Thermal Stresses, something like 2006 or so. This table is there. Okay, so what about mass matrix? Mass matrices and stiffness matrices, they are not symmetric. You don't know the bandwidth beforehand. You cannot tell what the bandwidth will be. Mass is, you know, symmetry, symmet, um, stiffness matrix may not be positive definite. Whereas in the finite element method, we have those nice properties. The symmetric banded, you know, um, the bandwidth beforehand, depending upon your mesh connectivity, and the stiffness matrix after you have applied essential boundary condition, this positive definite. I will quit in a minute, because you are waiting for the coffee break. So some of, some of the elements of mass matrix is not equal to the, not necessarily equal to the mass of the body, total mass of the body, but in the finite element method it is. Computation of total, uh, sorry? In, in the, I think there should have been a statement there, but 
maybe it will come. You will see it. It probably will come. So computation of the total strain energy. You need a background mesh. So in the finite element work, it's easy. Imposition of continuity conditions at interfaces between two materials. You have to do more work <coughs> in the ML in the meshless method than you have to do in the finite element method. Data preparation effort, that's the selling point on meshless method, it's very little. In the finite element method, you have to do a lot of work. Infinite domains, actually one of uh, one student in my class, he took that challenge to do the final exam. Typically, my final exam problem is you, you propose your own problem and solve it as far as you can. I think that's what I told you on the one. So it's typical. I mean, it's not, I'm not kidding. So he, he took that as a challenge. He took that problem. He said, I will do it for infinite domain. He could do it for one dimensional domain. But we cannot publish for one dimensional domain. So I said, no, we need to extend it to two dimensional domain. And he, um, no, he finished his PhD without doing that on a different problem. That was not his PhD problem. That was only the course problem for the course. So he got an A because he proposed something that we had not covered in the class. And he solved it as far as he could, which is OK. There was, it was not a requirement that you must solve you must have something that can be published. Some other people have done things like that that has been published. Okay, so in finite element method, it's relatively easy. Problem is finding the meshless basis functions for infinite domains, or two-dimensional problem. One-dimensional, yes, it works fine. If you have singularities like crack tips, it requires more work in the oh, Meshless method because we have to enrich our basis function. See, yesterday we took one x x square, but singularity are one over x. Sorry, one, square root of x type. So you have to add those terms in the polynomial basis function. So they are no longer polynomial. So you have to add those kind of terms, r is to the power minus one half or one half, in your depending upon you are talking about displacements or stresses. For displacements, it's r to the power one half. So we need to add that term. And if you add that, then it works fine. In the MLS, moving least square approximation, people have done it. And it works fine. SSPH, no, not done it yet. We tried, but we did not succeed. So we missed something. But we so the, in the finite element method, people do it. And that's from where we learn. They do it all the time. Mass, now this is again talking about fracture. A one way to delete, one way to simulate fracture is to delete elements. You can easily find in the finite element method because you delete an element. Here you delete what do you delete? A particle has zero mass. So that is a problem. If you use MSPH, which I did not talk about, modified smooth particle hydrodynamics method, in that one, to each particle, we associate a volume. So if you delete that particle, then we know how much volume we are deleting. But in the SSPH, did not associate volume to any, to any particle. So if you delete a particle, we don't know how much volume we are deleting. Okay, so that's that's why it's there. Incorporation of cohesive zone model, which I should talk about, it requires some effort in the MLPG, but basically no effort or very little effort in the finite element <coughs> method. Crack path. Here is an advantage: you can easily simulate. Here you have to pay the price because it's only along inter-element boundaries. And contact problems, they are not easy to solve in either one, either finite element or, I think you mentioned, I should talk about that, so I will. Energy balance, 
it's not easy to check in meshless, but it's easy to check in finite element because you, here you need a background mesh. So there are a couple of items missing on this table in this table, which I did not think of when we wrote uh, this table in the paper. But the other one, which I cannot show you because of uh, say the font size is too small, but that one has those items in it, and that one also is published. It's not not. I'm showing you a PDF file of a paper, so it's. Okay, thank you for uh, your patience. I'm sorry I kept you longer than your tea break. And maybe you can, I mean, coordinators decide how long is the tea break, not I. But I'm sorry, I kept you 15 minutes longer than I should. I still have not shown you that it's the most valuable of the video. 